just start about now. Um, just for, for you to understand, if you have already seen the slides, uh, the first part of it, the introduction, you know, is the same as yesterday. This is just for two reasons, because reason one, uh, this is just a recorded standalone, so it, it should be, I, I'm not repeating that uh, entirely and bo boring you with that even more. So we will just briefly go through the first few slides and I will just mention a few points on inducements. I have not mentioned that way yesterday. And this belongs again, I ask for your understanding to the concept of kind of bringing you to the things and then we can go and dive deep into the inducements details, which we have touched upon already. Of course, yesterday in uh, the course of the research session and of course just before uh, when covering and discussing all the point of sale things and including the UK perspective and what I'm quite convinced about and what's of course making things interesting in addition is just to, to compare, you know, the additional views from a continental perspective, um, from a German perspective in particular as what I'm aware of from, I know, the Austrian perspective and some others. Uh, and UK perspective, which for several reasons, you know, the, the regulator has been quite different. I would believe my colleagues always say we got a very bullish regulator. Uh, in Germany, I would say we have a rather conservative regulator, very um, rule-based uh, operating. Um, and the markets, of course, are somewhat different with all the independent financial advisors you had or have and the way uh, distribution is being done uh, elsewhere. So let's just start. Um, just briefly, um, only bringing us again uh, up to speed, um, we are more than ever, of course, talking about the investment services situation between the, um, the, the middleman, so to say, the middlewoman uh, and the client. And you mean, what's again regarding inducements, what's the specific issue about it is that we are talking about the service between the client and the intermediary on the right hand side at the top. Uh, however, the inducement is the money flow which is coming from the left-hand side to the middle. Just to remind us thereof and normally, and this is what we also learn from the, the, um, the picture below, if there's not a three-partite situation, there normally couldn't be an inducement. All these points again, things like ETF, you know, the, the most um, current and sexy product in some markets as I believe uh, in Germany, it's Getting, getting more and more speed. Um, somehow possibly also because, and we come to it later in more detail, um, that product does not contain uh, inducements uh, as kind of sales commissions. This picture was specifically made for the purpose of illustrating, you know, what is the reason for inducements rules. I showed it yesterday to you when we discussed product governance. Uh, but mainly, I think this illustrates, you know, what about conflicts of interest in the hard sense of uh, incentivation? You know, this is what I think mentioned uh, already. We all tend to do what we are incentivized to do. And of course, the picture here, you know, it's, it's much overemphasized, and this is a black and white approach, that you got three products available and two of which have a, so to say, reasonable commission and one has a, a kind of extraordinary one and then this product is being uh, recommended as being suitable. What I find interesting about this picture, and this is what we not discussed yesterday, is that under the existing MIFID I world, as far as I've experienced it and as far as I've experienced the auditors, the regulators approach, there had been suitability rules, there had been disclosure rules, there had been inducement rules. Um, however, in this situation, given that uh, the requirements of the suitability test um, have all been met. And given that the amount of the commission of 1,000 euros in this case has been properly disclosed in advance to the client, um, I would believe that the normal regulator under MIFID I would not have taken any notice uh, of this because one would have been in compliance with one's formal obligations. And um, John has mentioned a few occasions the the, the aspect of liability and of the courts um, in the continental system as far as I know it and particularly in Germany, uh, of course we, we don't have a, a kind of case law system but in this area we have largely case law because the, Germ the German and, and in other countries, in your country may be different, the relevant rules are very general civil law rules. You know, you can't derive very specific rules thereof. This is all done by the courts. However, this is a regime 
um, for example, in Germany, which is generally different. So the courts operate on the basis of their own rules and the regulator operates on the basis of the rules we are discussing here. And what I just want to say is that from a civil law perspective even, and there are quite strict disclosure rules on what is called kickback there, um, which is here the retrocessions or the inducements, uh, you would also not have done anything wrong if you would have properly disclosed this kind of amount of commission. And that's maybe one of the further reasons why people have not stopped with the former, uh, formerly existing inducements rules, which we have seen uh, since 2007, since the introduction of MIFID I. And the, the legislator, the regulator, has just possibly motivated by the UK and other countries mentioned yesterday, um, has gone a few steps further, which we will just look at in more detail in a moment. As in here you see again, on the top of my list of, of hot topics, so to say, of concepts which are substantially relevant, uh, of course, the inducements. And just having a brief look at this, why is it important just to have a look at it again? Um, we see, of course, some inducements rules in Article 24, paragraph 7, 8, and 9 of MIFID II itself. However, we see the rules making it more concrete regarding the quality enhancement, regarding non-monetary benefits, regarding research. I got it later on on my slides. You will find those in the uh, delegated directive of level two. And as you're aware, this is the only level two delegated directive act. So this leaves, leaves room for national implementation, for national, not necessarily gold plating, but for national kind of confirming or kind of trying to um, further going on with the former uh, situation of commission-based advice. And I think Germany, uh, to some extent, appear to have been an example for that. Uh, currently, we are a little bit in doubt of where the German, um, uh, the BaFin, uh, would like to go, in which direction I'm, I'm coming to th this also. So this was a political compromise. We got everything strictly regulated with regulations applicable everywhere the same way at level two, even the rules of, of MIFID II, the directive at level one. Um, but for, you know, kind of the crucial areas of product governance and in particular inducements, political compromise in, in 2016 or, or earlier even <coughs> was uh, that this is being done in a directive so member states have some room for uh, movement. But of course we got ESMA which will then follow up. And again here, I mean just briefly st only starting with this slide and then we are almost over the introduction. Um, I got four fields for the inducements, you may see that. This was not a copy and paste failure, it was just by, uh, I, I wanted to do that. Um, and uh, by intent, what I, what I have colored at the point of sale, I think that's the aspect just of simply of um, the disclosure of the inducements, <coughs> what we already had clearly under MIFID one. Uh, and then here uh, we move uh, further on and move back, so to say, for the sales organization, I would put uh, the issue of uh, documentation um, in particular for the purposes of the regulator. And then uh, on the left-hand side, this is then the issue of regulating whether you may be entitled to, to pay and or to accept and retain uh, inducements. Yeah, and again, I mean, this is, from my point of view, the, the most relevant uh, and the clearest strategic, strategically meant topic within this. Um, you, you start already to talk about business models uh, and about you know, what will be the future, how will it look like. We got some insights uh, just before from the UK uh, and I'm quite interested if you would like to, to discuss this then with you further, what does it mean? Uh, and I would like to just go step by step through the regime and then look at what can be done, what are markets uh, doing, what are market participants doing these days, how do people react uh, on that. Until here, we are all on the same page as it appears. Okay, I'm surprised how long this will go on. So what is the current practice uh, in the distribution? And I have been quite around. Of course, you, are, you know your country and your environment much better than I do. Um, um, I've been around from the northern parts of Europe to, until, to, to Cyprus, for example, over the past few years. Uh, on similar events like this one, on uh, events organized from in by industry associations and others and discussed quite a lot with people. And uh, just an insight I took with me from Cyprus was that the 
you know, you, you got different clients to some extent from different countries than in Germany, for example. Of course, you're a smaller country and have different banking system. Um, taking out, you know, the, the, the trouble some years ago. Um, however, the distribution system appeared to be commission-based in essence, um, as far as I have been, uh, been able to learn from, from talking to the regulator, talk to the, uh, the lady who was the boss of the CISEC and to some others there. Um, and the, the interesting um, picture I could take was this is more or less the same, I mean, smaller and differently colored than the one I know from from Germany, Austria, come across, you know, I I issues from Denmark, Belgium, uh, elsewhere. They have different regulators. The, some, some of the regulators have been a bit more bullish already, like in Belgium with uh, Jean-Paul Servet, um, and others have been a bit more formal and conservative. But what is the situation? And I think we have, um, without a picture before us, already addressed it. You got, again, my kind of three parties here. The service are provided on the right-hand side. Um, from a German perspective, and this is then civil law, you quite often find an advice agreement. This can even be done orally. You don't need to put it down in writing. Um, and you just go on advising someone. Uh, from a regulatory point of view, of course, this is then investment advice. We have discussed it uh, uh, quite intensively uh, yesterday and today. Uh, and there may be another kind of service agreement. If you are doing portfolio management, for example, you get, a, of course, a management agreement. If you are a bank, uh, as a distributor and intermediary, um, you know, this is simplified. There can be more parties, of course. Then you may have custody agreement uh, for securities, and then you got a lump sum fee. I mean, the figures here, you know, don't take them for granted. I hope the portfolio manager gets a higher fee, and for the custody, you will get a lower one. Uh, this is just to illustrate it here. Yes, and then you, for example, I mean, this doesn't only work with funds, of course, but for other products, structured products, you normally price in the fee you would like to charge, uh, then the margin. Has been a question already under MIFID 1, and when I yesterday, I think, referred to CESAR papers where things had been picked up but had not been follow up later, followed up later, uh, including by auditors and regulators, there was the, the discussion about our margins in that way, our margins part of the inducements re re regime. Can a margin be an inducement? And uh, until to date, I believe that one has tended to answer that question with a no, while under the cost transparency regime, as we just learned earlier today, this is now clear that they are a cost issue depending on the market risk um, criteria. And what does it, does it mean in practice? You know, you purchase a fund which is worth 100 uh, for 105. Again, you know, these are just figures I've, I've taken to illustrate um, it may be 103 or whatever, and you can often negotiate uh, the, this kind of uh, premium. <coughs> and the, the five out of that 105 are then being paid. And this is what has been discussed before. It's not paid directly by the, I mean, it's paid by the, by the client, uh, but not directly, um, rather indirectly here, and therefore this is an inducement. Uh, and there's the sales commission, the five up front, um, and then the trailer fee, for example, every year, <coughs> sorry, this, is, this then needs to be generated out of uh, management fees and other things, of course. And this, again, of course, deducts uh, the value of uh, assets which are available and which are to the benefit of the client. So having this kind of model as a general typical example in mind, uh, we can come and look at you know, what has, has the legislator uh, attempted to do with it and how does the, le the, the legislator and the regulator, and ESMA has been very active, um, for, for many uh, out there in the industry and the associations has been much too active and too proactive, not to say um, innovative and aggressive, as some people have pointed out, in terms of moving forward to uh, not allowing too much inducements being able to be, be paid um, in the new MIFID II world. So how does the new regime look like? You see the mixture of the red fields, which of course strike the eye. Um, you see some green fields, and then you see the more or less yellow area. Um, starting with the, with the red and green fields here, and we will just go into some more detail um, in the following, uh, and with my following slides. Other than before, 
the um, new rules include certain um, bans on inducements which are without exception somehow. You're aware that the independent investment advisor, how is it called, um, and the portfolio manager uh, under MIFID II are no longer allowed to uh, receive and retain uh, any monetary payments, say commissions, monetary benefits, commissions, uh, however you call it. Regarding non-monetary benefits, um, there's a distinction. Of course, this may be the potential loophole to circumvent uh, the prohibition of monetary inducements as always. You, you try to influence people otherwise if you are uh, paying, have been paid commissions before. So non-monetary benefits are also, for in both cases, uh, generally uh, prohibited. However, there's a carve out of, out of that for minor non-monetary benefits, and I'm coming to them uh, in a moment later. And what we have a little bit uh, figured out already yesterday is that the issue of research, I mean, it was not a part of this kind of concept from the beginning, as far as I've been aware of that. It has come up. Um, as a consequence and in coincidence, I believe, uh, or as a result of um, certain considerations, the FCA has been uh, done three, four, five years ago. And then this has been flowing into ESMA's considerations at that stage. I have not noticed that ESMA has been um, specifically influenced by UK approaches, I would say. Um, however, in that respect, definitely. Um, the research point came up, I think, in uh, the consultation paper of ESMA in 2014, um, and then it was connected to um, the theme of the inducements. What makes sense on, on the one hand, just from the very practical perspective, you know, if you uh, transfer and forward an order to a broker and then you get research for free, th this appears to be a similar situation. However, given this picture, it appeared not to be so easy to find the systematic place, if you look at it systematically or from a lawyer's perspective, where you need to put in the research um, uh, topic. And I would believe, and uh, we, we also come to it in a moment, and this is based on what ESMA has set out in its uh, Q&A on investor protection topics, research belongs to the red field on the right-hand side because it is prohibited without exception other than you make sure it is not research. Yeah, it does not qualify, but research cannot be a minor non-monetary non -monetary benefit, at least according to it. This is not a kind of uh, a priori logic, but uh, this is what I would say uh, we need to, to, to find it and need to see it according to what ESMA has um, further specified. And this generally applies to both of these services providers. However, and I just put a, a footnote more or less on it, for example, in Germany, the German legislator has uh, adopted a, a more strict approach. The German legislator um, has uh, colored the green field on the right top side uh, red. So uh, in Germany, an independent investment advisor, and it is not just only an unabhängiger Anlageberater, it is an unabhängiger Honoraranlageberater, so an independent fee-based advisor, to have a more simple uh, German word combination for that. Um, we will talk about fee-based advisors and other things uh, in a moment. Um, and, you know, you mentioned already the, the be people being prepared to pay fees or not. Uh, uh, I'm, I come to it also uh, later on. So this is just the, the upper part of it. And we will now and later on pick on the green fields, you know, what is the permissible, so to say, safe haven? What can I do as a portfolio manager? For example, in Germany, people are these days very concerned about, you know, can I attend any kind of conference on products, on services? Uh, can I just accept any kind of invitement, hospitality, whatever? And this is what we can pick up there. Uh, on the lower, lower half of that, uh, with the orange fields, I mean, this is where we come from, you know, where we have been at uh, since 2007. Uh, under the, so to say, more or less one-to-one -one transposition of MIFID I rules. For every investment or ancillary service, the rule was it is generally prohibited already, and I've been talking to uh, quite a few people, including sometimes from, from regulators um, over the past few years, which had been of, uh, which had appeared to be quite convinced that it, it is allowed generally to accept inducements. And I said, no, look, please, let's look into the, 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 the letter of the law and the language precisely. And it has said, and uh, this has survived in a way for these services here, uh, uh, 
uh, displayed here that you know it is generally prohibited to uh, accept and retain inducements. However, in the past, until 3rd of January this year, um, for all investment services, since then, only for those one uh, specified here, it is allowed, it can be allowed as a matter of exception uh, if the inducements are designed to enhance the quality of the relevant service. And again, you find what I find generally a, a bit odd as a situation if you just look at it and step back and look at it uh, in a naive way possibly. Sometimes this may help to understand things and, and backgrounds and, and interrelations. So what you have on the right-hand side uh, is the service and what you have on the left-hand side is the inducement and the inducement is being paid and needs to be justified because on the right-hand side the service is being enhanced quality-wise thereby. So, you know, the, the, what is on the, on the lower half here, non-independent investment advice, it was mentioned before by John, there's only one investment service as a category, uh, as a licensing requirement, a potential one, and which triggers uh, certain obligations. This is investment advice. However, for the purposes of distinguishing um, a certain subcategory, we have the independent ad investment advice, but this is not a category in investment service as such. And we know um, the independent advisor needs to fulfill certain requirements regarding the product selection, and of course, as we see here, has uh, strong restrictions in terms of uh, what it can accept as an inducement at all. Okay, so for the normal investment advisor, and for example in Germany, m more or less everyone will continue as a, so to say, normal non-independent investment advisor. And if I'm talking now about investment advisors, without any further specification, please uh, listen to it and read it as I mean those ones uh, which are non-independent investment advisors. And not to forget, the same rules apply for those providing um, brokerage services, non-advisory services, you know, mere intermediation, including execution-only services. The rules, you know, on the, with the yellow and the orange under uh, color here apply all the same way. So what would I like to look at with you now? First of all, looking at the, the half side with the orange color, you know, what does it mean more precisely, then we look at uh, the green fields and then we look uh, what it can all mean uh, together, including in terms of business models. So what does it mean? Um, let's look at it for the non-independent, yeah, no problem. Um, for the non-independent investment advisors, uh, and then I got a slide for uh, the non-advised services uh, in a moment. What it is, does it mean according, and now you need to look into the delegated directive, which contains certain detailed guidance, and this has been transformed, for example, as I tried to explain yesterday in Germany, in the Securities Trading Act and in a, in a um, following kind of level two uh, German act-like provision. And it says, a fee commission on non-monetary benefit, or everything that may exist, uh, needs to be justified by the provision of an additional or higher level service to the relevant client proportional to the level of inducements received. Sorry for the received typo, um, such as. So we see additional or higher level service. So apparently this needs to be something which is above the regulatory minimum. And the regulatory minimum already provides for suitability rules, disclosure rules, and, and, and. So the question can be, what does it then mean? It also provides for training rules for staff and other things, uh, in particular under MIFID II. However, um, the delegate directive uh, has provided two examples. Examples could be other situations. First of all, I labeled it with products. The provision of non-independent advice um, and access to a wide range of suitable um, products, uh, including those from third-party providers, which are not your best friends. So this should be a very easy, theoretically a very easy way to change uh, your, so to say, behavior as a distributor, just uh, pick up other products. Of course, this is difficult if you have a more or less closed shop uh, distribution system, which uh, is quite common, uh, for example, in Germany for various banking uh, groups and others. Um, or the other example is the provision uh, of non benefit investment advice combined with, you know, certain, so to say, ongoing additional um, uh, after the point of sale uh, happening um, services propositions. And I found it quite clear, at least from my kind of naive uh, view, 
that these two are just meant to address the sales commission regarding your wider range of products and the trailer fee regarding an ongoing service, an ongoing added value. And of course we are aware, and so you can just keep then the inducements as you have got it before. Um, we are aware that the uh, provision regarding the wide range of suitable instruments is in a, lit in a way it appears to be quite close to the criteria which I have not here for the independent investment advisor. You know, the independent investment advisor needs to have a product selection which is, is formulated and the language is a little bit like this one and this has moved, moved on afterwards from, from the, the wording uh, of, of ESMA's consultation paper first. However, it just means uh, look, look to a kind of third party providers, have an open architecture. And um, in, in Germany and Austria, for example, we got an additional specific ex example and normally when I the first time uh, explain this to people, we have been in, in Croatia with the Croatian regulator and last September, uh, people tend uh, to smile a bit about it. Um, and this means, and this is an example you can use for justifying uh, inducements generally um, if you facilitate enhanced access, whatever this means, I just translated it from German to advisory services, um, e.g., and again, this is an example within the example, by providing for widespread branch or advisor network, which ensures local availability of qualified advisors also in rural areas. Germany, you know, is a country with so many rural areas, so therefore we got many branches. Um, however, this has just been meant, and I'm not going to, um, to, to give a judgment on that, but it's just the way it works. This is being meant to just go on when you have a branch network as you have done before. Yeah, you can just use the commissions to finance your branch network. However, um, in times where people just move on to online ways and digital ways of um, having provided financial services to them, and or where branches are being shut down due to cost considerations, the question is how long this can and how far this can bring you into the future. The Austrian, uh, in Germany, this is uh, in the, I said, in the Verordnung at, uh, so to say, German uh, level two legislation, so to say. Uh, and in Austria, it, is, it has been uh, put down in the act itself, however, with a much uh, uh, kind of more simple wording when I think it says the provision um, of a qualified access to investment advice through a certain network or so. However, this is another example we face and we are looking uh, forward to the industry uh, dealing with this. Um, I tell you why uh, over the next few slides there are certain kind of hurdles you need to overcome. And of course already you may notice um, and there has been a, an opinion of a parliamentary uh, body in Germany internally from the Bundestag, the parliament, they have said, no, this is not compliant with EU law. However, this has been then become a law um, in particular because how does it work if you need to um, have a quality enhancement for the relevant client? How does it work with a branch network? And then another example, and if you read, carefully read recital 22 of the delegate directive, I think it is crystal clear to you and the English version is even clearer than the German, for example. Um, this recital refers to when you provide independent investment advice, then for example, you need to show this or that as a quality enhancement, these two examples here. And then it says, in other situations, for non-advised services, you should do that. And then it shows this example. And these three are just uh, below each other in Article 11, Paragraph 2 of the Delegated Directive. And I was always quite convinced that the third one, because it has a certain overlap in the language with the ones we have seen on the previous slide, could only refer to something else than investment advice. The German way to read it these days is still unclear, but there's a tendency, and the legislator has, has written it in, uh, in, in the, when he has explained the reasonings for this very briefly, that this may also apply for investment advisory services. Anyway, the, the European uh, rules here didn't mean this. They meant other services, non-advisory services, and uh, all other things other than the ones listed on the slide before. And this is a mixture of products, tools, and so on. I think this clearly relates to the level. You know, you need to, to be better than. If you need to provide an additional or higher level service, 
Of course, the level of service for investment advice is from the beginning higher regarding the requirements uh, due to the regulations than for non-advisory services. So what you need to do on top should be different normally. So this makes some sense for me. But when you just deal with the branch network and things like this, then you get into a little bit kind of um, vague uh, situation in terms of logical reasoning, however. And then, of course, there are certain additional requirements which you find uh, also, and these all have been transformed, uh, for example, into German law. Um, and the first one is now making people a little bit struggling. The inducement does not directly benefit the in recipient firm, its shareholders and employees, without tangible benefit to the relevant client. So the German wording is a little bit like, um, you know, it does not, it's not possible that it immediately and directly benefits the recipient firm and it also needs to benefit somehow uh, the client. And um, in connection with the documentation, I'm telling you in a few moments, there a few doubts have been arising whether you can really deal with this uh, on the basis of uh, including the branch network example. And then again, an ongoing benefit uh, needs to um, relate to an ongoing inducement, a benefit for the client. I mean, this matches, I think, the example shown before for the quality enhancement. Um, and then it shouldn't be, your services shouldn't be biased or distorted. I think that's a very general rule. I found it quite important from the beginning when ESMA has created this language in its consultation paper 2014. However, for example, in German law, this doesn't play a kind of really prominent role. It's just in a way repeated, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it will be, so to say, enforced specifically. Yes, and then a kind of evidence documentation. And of course, we need to distinguish between the disclosure, next slide, towards clients, and the documentation uh, towards the regulator and the auditor, of course. And here, this is about the documentation um, for the purposes of the regulator and the auditor. Um, the investment firm needs to hold evidence that any inducements, and here it says paid or received, let's just stay with the received at the moment, are designed to enhance the quality of the service, of course, and then you need to have an internal list of all inducements received and then uh, show and record and document how the inducements enhance the quality of the services. And again, it talks about uh, honestly, fairly, and professionally, and steps to be taken in order to deal with that and the best interests of the client. And again, here, you know, you see the quality of the relevant service, and in the second bullet point, recording blah, blah, provided to the relevant client. You know, there's always a more specific link between um, the inducement and the client. In Germany, since I think it was 2012, we have had a similar requirement. Uh, this is in German language, but anyway, um, from, from the BaFin within what we have already learned yesterday, this MA comp, um, they, they have certain modules, they call it, uh, with more detailed requirements. Uh, they've introduced in 2012, uh, somehow as a gold plating exercise to MIFID 1, a requirement to have a um, register of inducements and how you use them. It calls, it's called Zuwendungs- und Verwendungsverzeichnis. And this is quite similar to the approach you find here in the box at the, at the bottom. Um, and now the BaFin has done a consultation in November. And as far as I know, until yesterday at least, they have not brought up the final uh, and uh, relevant version now. Uh, consultation in November telling, look, we will continue with this kind of register requirement. Of course, this is now exactly in line with EU law. However, you do not only need to register your inducements and how you spend them, you also need to have a kind of register of measures or steps taken. And BaFin really highlighted that, and they have told people otherwise, including on a major conference, but I've referred to uh, other um, parts of the German uh, implementation law, um, the aspect that you know, the, the inducement shall not benefit the firm as such, it shall always equally and at the same time benefit uh, the client somehow. And here they have made quite clear in this, in this consultation for the time being that they want to see a more specified approach that when you receive inducements, you need to qualify for which services, for which clients or groups of clients you use them. And just that you are aware if you're uh, not, not from Germany or um, are aware how this has, has worked. For example, if you are a bank and you have re received, say, uh, 4 million uh, euros of inducements, 
then you have just listed um, 10 product providers, each 400,000, say, and then on the spending side, um, where you have, have shown your own kind of investments of that 4 million, you need, just needed to make sure, otherwise the auditors were a little bit skeptical, that uh, on the right-hand side it is not kind of 3.8 or 4.2 million, it just needed to be 4 million, otherwise people became nervous. Uh, and you could just show infrastructure 1 million, um, uh, branches 1 million, um, a personal HR cost 1 million and 1 million for whatever. And now the question is just, do I need to do it the same way or can I just keep something for myself? And then the discussion has been arising. I mean, if I'm a bank, I'm doing payment services, I'm, doing, uh, I'm, I'm dispersing loans to clients, mortgage business, blah, blah, blah. So I may have a situation where all my uh, receptions and spendings in the investment services business are just one-to-one -one, and I earn my money elsewhere or I can allocate it elsewhere. But those who are smaller investment services providers who only work on, for example, providing um, non-independent investment advice, um, how can they get, where can they get their money from, you know? And so they are struggling with the anticipation of ho how this will uh, be operated, what, what it will mean, and if it may, at the end of the day, um, result finally what people have hoped not, uh, not to happen, yeah, more or less in a very strict uh, inducements regime so that you can try to operate on the basis of the exemption, including with a branch network, but when it comes to documentation for supervisory purposes, you are likely to fail uh, to just deal with these high requirements. And this again, I didn't uh, um, emphasize it before, shows quite clearly to me an example of where you have faced a strategic uh, issue and the operational complexity has been risen and risen and is rising still and is arriving at a point where your business model may not no longer work just on the basis of not changing anything. And this is where we are in the middle of, for example, in Germany, and I'm quite interested to see how this will end up. I have a few, few slides in a moment at the end just to show that the business models are not just black or white, possibly. And of course, this needs to be disclosed to clients. This is not generally new. Um, I would just go over this at this time. Um, and then possibly just two slides about, um, looking at the clock, two slides about the, these minor non-monetary uh, benefits. Mm. This refers to, you know, where the, the red fields have been. And if you can see it on the, the top uh, at the right, I have kind of tried to make a dotted line around these, these green fields. Um, if you ask yourself as a portfolio manager, for example, and in particular, or in your countries possibly as an independent investment advisor, you know, can I attend any kind of um, conference? Uh, can I uh, kind of accept any kind of invitation by a product uh, provider with whom I am working or expect to work or consider to work? Um, what does it mean? You know, does it qualify as a minor non-monetary benefit? And then first of all, you need to ask yourself, and this only becomes clear when you have properly read um, uh, as, as it is uh, with MIFID II, and I think this is what we have learned yesterday and today, uh, in particular for the investment, investor protection area, uh, properly read uh, the Q&A um, of ESMA regarding the investor protection topics, and properly read the recitals in the, in particular, delegated directive and regulation. And ESMA has quite cre clearly uh, made it and is about two pages here uh, in uh, uh, page 53 it is, uh, what I have uh, quoted here, uh, that you can either qualify a non-monetary benefit as research, then the research rules apply, I got a slide on this also, or these are minor non-monetary benefits. So first of all, any possible permissible minor non-monetary benefit can under no circumstances be research at the same time. And then other um, requirements uh, you, you need to meet here. Um, those minor non-monetary benefits are only minor if they are capable of enhancing the quality of service. I mean, this is again the same language we have seen before in the orange area. I believe you need to deal with it separately here because it is another and a different um, a circumstance and connection. Um, and then they need to be again reasonable and proportionate and of such, such a scale, they are unlikely to influence 
the firm's behavior at the detriment of the client. I mean, these are all the same kinds of phrases which uh, are going to, to kind of point at the conflict of interest and that you shall not uh, unduly be influenced by, by things you get by that. Um, and then, and this is, you can only find it again in the recital, it says um, those benefits do not involve the allocation of valuable resources to you as a portfolio manager. I think you can just not let it, let this stand as it is because this would, I think, at the end of the day mean you couldn't just accept any uh, non-monetary benefits, but we see uh, a list of examples I got on the next slide uh, which shows something must be possible. Um, and of course then it needs to be clearly disclosed and here again this is the area of disclosure towards the clients and quite important for many people for example in Germany those benefits may be described in a generic way so you only need to inform the client generically that you are dealing with non-monetary benefits. It, it does not require a more detailed approach and the BaFin in the consultation I've shown you on the previous slide has uh, at least indicated they will use the same concept for the documentation for its purposes. So they, then it matches what you need to tell the client. So and this, of course, brings some room for kind of reasoning what is a minor non-monetary benefit without disclosing any detail of the reasons to the general public and or the regulator. And what are the examples? And uh, some of us discussed already yesterday evening uh, sitting in the wine room, uh, what are the examples? These examples are set out in the delegated uh, directive and I've uh, double checked it before. Um, what can you accept and retain as a uh, portfolio manager in particular? What is a minor non-monetary benefit potentially? And then it says, okay, information or documentation and it refers to a financial instrument or an investment service, so quite specific. <coughs> Written material and then my kind of favorite examples, the third and the fourth bullet participation in conferences, seminars, and other training events on the benefits and features of a specific financial instrument or an investment services, service, or hospitality of a reasonable de minimis value, such as food and drink during a business meeting or conference or seminar, as mentioned before. In Germany, it has been transformed a bit differently. Uh, the hospitality uh, example just says hospitality of a reasonable de minimis, de minimis value, full stop. They don't make a link to a conference. So many people ask themselves, you know, having conferences in f five star hotels uh, in, in, in the Alp Mountains and somewhere else where it's nice at the sea, uh, can you just still be invited by certain uh, kind of asset managers who potentially provide products to you as a portfolio manager? Um, what does it cost? What can you do? Uh, and people are just arguing, you know, how can you um, uh, describe this and how can you show that this is a reasonable value about it? Um, and a way may be that you see is a really connection to your investment services because this is a requirement. It needs to be connected to your portfolio management. If you don't provide those products to your customers, possibly there's even no link. And or, you know, this always refers to specific instruments, specific services, and you may not have that link. And finally, there's a kind of an, a provision opening. Uh, Simon, and I think this is what we discussed yesterday, um, and it says, I have put it in an abbreviated way, are deemed capable, it says, a member state deems capable of enhancing the quality. So the member states are free to, to introduce additional examples, but for example in Germany uh, this has not been the case, it just says, for example. Yes, and only for the sake of completeness, and um, looking at the clock I believe uh, we got it within the next five minutes. Um, Research, I said, this is quite important. If you look at a non-monetary benefit, it should not be research. Interestingly, you know, the definition you only find, I mean, it's even not a definition. I would say it's a description. You find in, in the recital of the delegated directive a quite long description, and it's not really clear, I would believe. And for research, you know, um, the rules and the game is quite clear. Either you handle research in a way that the exception provides for, you pay for it yourself or you um, employ a research payment account or this is just prohibited yeah? and you can't argue about non-monetary minor benefit and so on. And as you're aware and we discussed it yesterday, you know, these are the two ways to deal with it. I have a slide on the operation, the general conditions for the operation of a research payment account, but I must admit 
I've not seen any single situation where a research payment account was operated and I was asked to advise on it. So everyone just pays for oneself and then you, are, you get rid of the inducements regime. What needs to be done? What I always say and just I'm not getting tired to repeat, the inducements regime is a regime you don't need to comply with necessarily. If you are providing investment services to retail clients, you need to comply with cost transparency. You need to deal with documentation, taping requirements. You can't get rid of it. You can try to legally argue here and there, but you need to deal with that somehow. It is costly and you need to, to, to find a way uh, to get along with it and have a good service hopefully for your uh, clients and good products. The inducements regime only applies if you accept inducements. You know, if you have payments, and this is the normal case I know, or has been the normal case, which are coming from the left-hand side to the middle. And don't be confused. The, the business models, and I'm happy that this is the case, not only we can advise on it, but it is just common sense and, and the prudent way and reasonable. Business models are, even in a regulated world, and this is a, a, a common misunderstanding quite often, are not prescribed by regulators or legislators. You can still consider your business model if you are an investment firm. And for example, this means you can consider how you could try to substitute the reception and the, the acceptance of inducements. Non-monetary benefits, you know, you need information, you want to know about the product, you want to have certain kind of socializing, this is what we all want, and I hope it can, can survive. But you can turn around and try to get the money from the client. Because, you know, when the inducement needs to be justified by the client service and the enhancement of the client service and you need to have an ongoing service and the client has not got it before and you need to explain it end and end. So why not considering to put the price tag from the wrong side, so to say, because no one understands, you know, the, you, the, the customer so far gets one price tag. And this is, as I had it, 105. But this includes, of course, the product cost and the service cost. And at the end of the day, the normal customer doesn't understand that. Yeah? So just unbundling, and this is the same idea with the research, unbundling these two prices to two different price tags, one for the, the product and the other one or two for the services, that's the idea. And quite interestingly, as you mentioned before, John, in Germany, the example is always made with buying a car, of course. Yeah? Um, is about I buy certain goods for my kind of day-to-day -day life or a car, for example, and one doesn't need to tell me all the details one needs to tell one here. And I always say, okay, understood. On the one hand, this is a political way to deal with it, but on the other hand, if you as an investment firm compare yourself with a car dealer, and people say, if I go to BMW, I know I won't be recommended a Mercedes, normally at least, or a Toyota, whatever. Um, or a Renault, I know. Um, I, I don't mention anymore, sorry. Um, however, when I'm going to my investment advisor, this investment advisor in an inducements regime is a seller, that's what we know, is a seller. And comparing oneself with other sellers, I think, is a little bit, it depends. If I'm an advisor, I would not only sell. You know, and I think that's the difference. Of course, in Germany we say financial products are not being bought, they are being sold. But the question is, you know, if the seller calls oneself, I'm your advisor, but in effect and in essence is a seller, then of course we got a wrong labeling here. And I think this is what is all about, the, the regulation is all about, and they try to get rid of these kind of, the mix up, and uh, is a bit black and white as I describe it, of course. Uh, but this is a way forward towards the commission-free world. And what I would say, of course, there are kind of market turbulences somehow if you've got 20,000 people providing independent financial advice and you make a change in the requirements. But I believe in the UK, and you know it much better, of course, it was not only the ban on inducement. It was, was mentioned before, it was a kind of certain transparency and it was certain kind of qualification and training criteria. And then people failed to uh, kind of comply with all three. You know, it was not just the ban on inducements. And the normal argument, of course, is including in Germany, and it's very widespread, that people say, look, when I don't get the inducement, then I earn nothing because the client is not prepared to pay fees. And then they look into the law and say, look, there's a provision for an independent advi advisor or independent fee-based advisor. I'm not going to do this. And they say, okay, this is just 
a suggestion, as I said, a suggestion from the regulator, possibly not having understood the entire story, how you can change your business model. But you can just remain a non-independent uh, in investment advisor, for example, or you can be a someone who's providing non-advised sales, and then you can turn to the client, and in my example, you got five upfront and you got one annually. You can charge your client five upfront directly. You can charge your client one every year. This is then a matter of civil law, of what we ha have uh, as you know, contract terms and conditions, and, and, and. And it may be a matter of tax law when there is a VAT applying on this. But from a legal and regulatory perspective, if I charge my client upfront the five from my previous slide, 100 for the product, fair enough, that's the product as such. I charge upfront five or four, whatever, and I charge every year one, and I have an ongoing service with, with which I can justify it, and I have a changed business model, and I have lump sum fees, whatever. I mean, this, this is not the first time I, I would, I, people have talked about it, and many, including like Commerzbank, they have introduced similar, uh, at least, propositions for certain clients, and not only for the most wealthy ones. Um, you know, just want to tell you, and I put it down here, um, if you are an intermediary, please look, can your business model change towards being more client-oriented, including in terms of how and when do I charge and for what? And of course, from the perspective of the asset manager, this is a bit twofold because the incentivization via the inducement, of course, falls away. So this is a quite complex situation, and, but I'm quite convinced that the world will not, will not uh, stop kind of turning around. We have seen it in the Netherlands where they introduced the ban on inducements and I've no heard from no one, uh, to be honest, and I've tried to find out quite often that anything has substantially changed in terms of provision of products of services to clients. And UK, I think, is a little bit different scenario due to the, how the market looked like. And then, of course, I'm looking at the clock now, finally, um, uh, robo-advisors, depending, of course, on you know, how big your market, your country, uh, and how many players uh, are around in Germany, those step in. Often now, in connection with a, um, a bank, for example, they are investment firms in a way that they provide investment services. They're not a bank, and now banks cooperate with them, or they cooperate with banks. ING DIBA, which is a direct banking function of ING in Germany, which is, uh, has no branch at all, and which is very kind of innovative, uh, and very, um, in, in, in a way, aggressive, possibly in a positive way. They are making advertisements ten, since 10 years with Dirk Nowitzki, if you may know him, and it's quite funny to, to see it on TV. Um, I, I have no special deal with that bank, not to be misunderstood. Um, but for example, they have uh, entered into a cooperation with um, one of the, so to say, most uh, successful so far um, robo-advisors. And those robo-advisors, interestingly, do not try to copy the old world business model they work on the basis quite often of being a portfolio manager. You know, and you can start with five or 10,000 euros. And as we all know, the portfolio manager works on the basis of no commissions at all. So they enter the mar to market, they have a, so to say, fancy interface to the client, they work transparently. Um, I'm not going to, to kind of market their services here, but they, they just show, I think, somehow where, in which direction it can go if you look just uh, to your client. If they have the right products and if their three ETFs are the right ones, that's another story, of course. But they just point uh, where the, di the direction where it may, may can go, you know, standardized services, including portfolio management for smaller amounts, without commissions, um, quite transparent, and let's see what the future brings in that respect. And then finally, this one, which wo I was referring to earlier, I mean, just the quite common example um, I've come across, the one in the box on top of the asset manager services provider on the left top is the same entity as the distributor or intermediary. You know, this is an, uh, a portfolio manager managing a portfolio for the client, working together with the asset manager in terms of having a white label fund or something else. This is all common practice and nothing to worry about it. And at the same time acts as a um, external portfolio manager for the asset manager for the fund uh, company. Um, and of course, if the asset manager is paying from the left-hand side to the middle to the distributor, um, then this qualifies as an inducement and will no longer happen for a portfolio manager. But if the same person is working here, what I call the services provider on the left-hand side at the top, 
uh, and is receiving money from the asset manager for the portfolio management services, then of course you get your money directly from your client. Uh, uh, and in addition, of course, you can ask who is what kind of eligible counterparty and do the rules apply, but there, and ESMA has clarified it also in their Q&A recently, uh, and I was convinced about it all the time, uh, there you get your money from the client. However, and possibly is this, this is what, what has been asked before, if you say, okay, I'm the same legal entity and I'm, I'm clear with my part regarding inducements and I'm clear regarding my part being paid directly by the client, of course you need to have a proper documentation, you need to have a proper organization and the issue of conflicts of interest is of course at stake. Yeah, you need to deal with it. There may arise conflicts of interest when you are dealing at these two stages, but so far, um, for example, the German regulator has not picked that up and not found it in any way um, uh, n not, not, in, not okay to, to go ahead with. And that's it. If you've got any kind of final question, happy to answer. <laughs>